Hey everybody, this is the start of a new series of videos called Medical Facts as an FAQ for Frequently Asked Questions. I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician here in Central Florida, and prior to medical school I was a respiratory therapist for about five years, including time in the neonatal intensive care unit. So I've been doing this uh, for a long time and have been working in the hospital since I was about 18 years old, really. So it's time to share some of this information to uh, answer questions you may have had. And certainly I'm open to suggestions for other topics to cover as long as we can keep them uh, reasonably short topics. Uh, today's topic is understanding oxygen therapy and when do you need oxygen? It's a common joke in uh, pulmonary circles that the people that need oxygen don't want it and the people that don't need oxygen are dying for it and really wanna have it. Um, one of the things that people have to understand is your oxygen level doesn't necessarily correlate that well with how you feel. You can feel pretty good with a terrible oxygen level that's actually dangerous and you can feel terrible with a great oxygen level. And if you have a great oxygen level, adding additional oxygen doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't make you breathe better other than maybe the psychological effect. With the basics, it's a oxygen therapy, whether it's delivered by a mask or a nasal cannula or a respirator, is a treatment that provides you with a higher concentration of oxygen than exists in the room air. Uh, the air all around us carries about 21% oxygen with the balance, the large amount of it being nitrogen and a few trace elements. It's commonly used in hospitals and ambulances and uh, in airplanes that fly at high altitude where the uh, total pressure of oxygen is too low to maintain adequate levels of oxygen in the blood. And of course, it's used for people that have pulmonary disease or sometimes heart disease resulting in hypoxia. Hypoxia refers to just the lack of oxygen and hypoxemia means the lack of oxygen in the blood. We generally will qualify a patient for using oxygen if their blood oxygen saturation is less than 90%. Uh, Medicare calls for less than 88%, except in the cases of uh, heart failure or chronic constructive pulmonary disease, but somewhere around 90 or so is usually considered sufficient. You would probably like to have a little bit of buffer for that in the 92 range if you're actually on oxygen therapy, but there's usually not very much benefit to push the saturations much above that level, and sometimes there's actually harm to raise the oxygen saturations too high, not to mention that you are more likely to run out of oxygen if you're depending on a portable system. So when is oxygen therapy required? When we can document by an, an uninterested third party, which means somebody who's not in the business of selling you the oxygen, uh, that your oxygen saturation is less than 90% under some circumstance. It could be less than 90% at rest, in which case you would need to use the oxygen 24 hours a day. It could also be less than 90% when you're walking or exercising, in which case you would need oxygen only during those activities or it could be dropping less than 90% during sleep. Though ideally, if it's dropping during sleep due to sleep apnea, we would treat that with a uh, pressure device such as CPAP or BiPAP rather than needing to use oxygen. But there are people that as a result of cardiopulmonary disease have low oxygen levels that are not associated with sleep apnea, and those patients do need to sleep with uh, oxygen, usually via a nasal cannula. How do we determine the oxygen level? The most common thing to use is a pulse oximeter. A pulse oximeter, uh, the most commonly used now, are a little finger clip device that sends a couple of lights through your finger and measures the relative absorption of a couple different colors of light by either hemoglobin, which is the iron-containing molecule uh, that carries oxygen in your blood, compared to oxyhemoglobin, which is hemoglobin already bound to oxygen, and it expresses a result in terms of a percentage of oxygen saturation. If all of the hemoglobin molecules are carrying oxygen, your saturation is 100%, and if none of them are carrying oxygen, you're dead. But your oxygen level would be 0%, presumably. And if half of the molecules have oxygen, your saturation would be 50%. And again, as I said, you want to have the saturation stay above 90%, preferably in the low 90s. These pulse oximeters used to cost thousands of dollars, but now are available as little as $18 on Amazon.com. Because these devices depend on being able to detect a pulse, usually in the finger, it is important to verify that the device is actually picking up the pulse so that you know you can trust the oxygen values read. And the better pulse oximeters include a waveform display, that's wave, W-A-V-E, form display, 
so you can see that the device is actually picking up your pulse. And if it's picking up the pulse, you can generally trust the oxygen saturation numbers that are given. Almost all of these devices also count your pulse in terms of beats per minute, so you can see what your heart rate is when you use the device. You can buy these things at drugstores such as CVS or Walgreens, and they typically cost around $50 there. But as I said on Amazon, they are generally much cheaper, and I will include a link to one or two of these in the um, description of the video below. You can buy oxygen on your own with the doctor's order, uh, but there, again, there's no need to if your oxygen saturations are already above 90%, unless there's some circumstance where they drop. You may be aware that the uh, more recent versions of the Apple Watch now measure an oxygen saturation. They do so intermittently, and because the device is not able to wrap around a perfused uh, finger because it's on your wrist, the accuracy is less than you would get with a finger pulse oximeter. It is also very sensitive to movement, and to take a reading, you have to hold perfectly still for 15 seconds, and usually it will come up with a reasonable facsimile of your oxygen level. But the Apple Watch readings are not sufficient to qualify somebody for insurance purposes to get on home oxygen, or for medical purposes for that matter. What kind of oxygen would you be prescribed? Most of the time, it would be nasal cannula oxygen. A e-cylinder, which is a portable oxygen tank that's about three to four feet tall, holds about 600 liters of oxygen. And typical home orders for oxygen range from one to six liters per minute through the nasal cannula device. So if you're on five liters a minute and the device holds 600 liters, you can do the math and see that you're gonna get probably a little bit over 100 minutes of oxygen before that tank runs out. The more popular option is a portable oxygen concentrator, which is a rechargeable battery device that actually filters oxygen out of the air. They do have a flow limitation that they usually can't go above about four liters per minute, and most of them have a cons conservation methodology that will only give the oxygen while you're breathing in so that the device doesn't have to run continuously. The batteries typically can last up to about six hours, and some units support more than one battery, and almost all units allow you to have a spare battery that you can change out. The other nice thing about the portable oxygen concentrator is you can actually recharge it by plugging it into your car while you're with your car <clears throat> so that you're really never going to run out using that device. They are somewhat expensive. Insurance will cover them if you have mobility needs that depend on using one, but if you were to buy, pay cash for one, they're around $3,000. At home, you will typically be set up with a larger concentrator device, which again is the oxygen filtering device that will plug into a wall outlet and they'll typically give you enough tubing to walk around the house while connected to that. The tank oxygen is sort of the default go-to as a backup, uh, and they will typically give you a large tank in the house that maybe holds 3,000 liters just to use in case you lose your electricity, which in Florida, of course, could happen around hurricanes and tropical storms. Occasionally, we'll put people on a mask, but they tend to be claustrophobic and sicker patients that require mask oxygen as opposed to nasal oxygen, but that's kind of unusual. So for the most part, we will give somebody oxygen if their oxygen levels are low. Of course, many times it's a temporary need because if you come out of the hospital with pneumonia and your oxygen levels are too low to go home without oxygen, you may be started on oxygen in the hospital and typically we'll have a full follow-up visit in our office where we'll check it again. And more times than not, after two or three weeks of leaving the hospital, you no longer require the oxygen. I encourage my patients to buy their own pulse oximeter and that way they can adjust their oxygen concentrations uh, or their oxygen liter flow on the, on the device based on their blood oxygen saturation to whatever amount of oxygen flow is necessary to maintain their oxygen saturation in the low 90s. This both avoids hypoxia if they use too little and avoids wasting oxygen and or battery supply if they use too much. And for some conditions, higher oxygen concentrations have been associated with worse outcomes, particularly with people with severe disease such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So hopefully this answers all the questions you can imagine about pulse oximetry and about oxygen requirements and how we decide whether somebody needs oxygen and how we would give oxygen. Feel free to leave comments below and I'll answer the questions as best I can. And until next time, this is Dr. Don. See you later. And let me take this opportunity to remind you that it really helps my channel a lot if you will click the subscribe button share these videos with people you think might find them interesting, such as on your Facebook or other social media, and also to hit the like button. 
as this will improve the distribution of the videos and help it reach more people. Thanks a lot.